And yes, please grab a seat. And uh, good to have all of you with us today. You guys feeling good? So um, we're going to continue in our study of the book of Romans. And uh, we did uh, start Romans 5 last week. So why don't we be turning our Bibles to Romans 5? And of course, in Romans 5, we were covering a couple things. And I don't know if you realize it, but we only covered two verses last week. I mean, there's so much in those first two verses that we had to just stop right there and really dive into it. And uh, we covered verse one, which says, since we've been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into this grace in which we now stand. And that's where we finished this past Sunday. So for the Latinos who have all the notes translated by Fabian, you're still good to go with the same notes you had last week. Amen? Hopefully Fabian, you did that, right? You translate them? He didn't do it. Okay, well, amen. Well, good to know while I'm up here in this awkward setting right now. This is awesome. So anyway... I'll try to, I I can't preach slow enough for the translation to work here, but anyway, you guys will get it and I'll send you the notes later. So we have um, in verse one, these two things. We're justified through faith, right? So it's, what does justified mean? Just as if I never sinned right there. And so two, we have three fruits that come from that fact. And we covered only two of them last week. The first one is, we have peace with God. The second one is, now we stand in grace. And we talked about how awesome that is. Remember the shower that we talked about as you go through the desert of the world, knowing that God's grace is there to refresh your life. And as long as you're striving with all your might to walk in the light, that God is able to allow that grace to stand with what you're in. Amen? Amen. And uh, for us as disciples, that should be very encouraging. And so from there, we go on to the next parts of this scripture. And let's just dive right into it. It says, the second part of verse 2. And we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Now, interestingly enough, as we jump into that word hope, this is not like G, I really hope I have a date this Saturday. That can be a little shaky for some of you guys, amen? But the concept of hope, as one author put it, is a happy certainty right here. So in other words, it's totally for sure, amen? So it's not like when you die, you make it through and and God says, okay, uh, you got your ticket, all right, there's your ticket, all right, let me punch that thing right there, but God gave you your ticket at baptism. Amen? And that's when you received it from the Lord, and now you get to carry around your ticket of salvation wherever you go. It's already been punched. Amen? And so now you have to say, okay, if you're a disciple that's been baptized, you can genuinely say, I am saved. Not Hopefully I'm saved, or maybe one day it'll happen, but I am saved right now. Amen, guys? And that needs to just pick up your spirits a little bit, and we all need to be fired up about it. Amen? Let's go to verse 3. It says, not only so, but we also rejoice in our sufferings, because we know that suffering produces perseverance perseverance, character, and character, hope. All right, let's stop right there. So it says, not only are we finding out about the peace and the grace and the glory, but it says there's also something else. I mean, you thought the peace was good. You thought the grace, standing in that grace was good. You thought the glory of the hope of salvation was good. But there's even something that goes along with all this. Don't forget that we rejoice. We rejoice in our sufferings. Amen? 
That's awesome. Then you say, hold it, bro. You got me all fired up about the peace and you got me all fired up about the grace and that shower, that was awesome and nice and, and the glory of heaven. But now we're talking about suffering. Let's read it all together. Let's go to verse four. So it says, it says, for verse three, we, re we were also rejoice in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance, perseverance, character, and character, hope. And hope does not disappoint us because God has poured out his love into our hearts by the Holy Spirit whom he has given us. So one of the awesome things about when you become a Christian is you not only get justified by God, just as if I've never sinned, amen? But you also, not only do you get your sins forgiven, but he also gives you his spirit to live inside your heart right here is what's talking about. Isn't that incredible? And so it would really not be a good thing if he says, okay, your whole life you've been flailing, you've been trying to repent of sin and you've been unable to, and now you're getting baptized and what would happen if there was no help from where we'd been at before? You with me? So you remember when you got baptized, right? Yeah. And, and God says, okay, imagine, he says, okay, now just try to live the Christian life. Like just try to become like Jesus just on your own strength right here. And we'd be messing up all over again, falling on our face over and over again. It would just be impossible to live that kind of life. So God says, listen, I am going to give you my spirit inside of you. And it's going to give you the power to not keep falling on your face and flailing right here. Now, you got to use that power. You know, you got to tap into the strength. But it's inside of you. And that power is through the prayer and through the fellowship so that you can overcome any sin that has ever mastered you. Amen? And there's nothing that the Holy Spirit cannot conquer. That should be encouraging right there. Amen, guys? Should fire you up. And so God says, man, we got to get you ready for heaven right here. So we're going to start working on transforming you now. And so he says, yeah, you rejoice in the peace. Yeah, get fired up about the grace which you're now standing in. Yeah, you can look forward to heaven, but also the icing on the cake. You get to rejoice in your suffering. Not because of the sufferings themselves, amen, guys? But because suffering, when you have the strength of the Holy Spirit in your life, Suffering is something that's going to produce perseverance right there. You read that? What does perseverance produce? If you keep persevering, it's going to produce endurance. If you keep enduring, what's that going to produce? That's where the character comes in. Amen? And once you get character, what happens? It leads us to a hope that will not disappoint us right there. So right now, you got to say, man, I feel awesome about my sufferings as long as I'm walking with the Lord right here and have the Holy Spirit in my life. Yeah. Now, when you're now, the, the tempting thing is you go through sufferings and you can get tempted to get bitter and stop walking with God. Yeah. And as soon as that happens, then sin becomes a lot more tempting and enticing. Yeah. And pretty soon, if you allow yourself to stay in that state, it overcomes you. Yeah. And so that's why it's so important to say, I got to get my strength from God's spirit right here to help me walk this Christian life and overcome the sin that is tempting when I go through my suffering. Amen, guys? You with me? So understanding that, for me personally, I feel like the congregation right now is going through a lot. You've already gone through a transition back in October. And you lost like 25 people. The Franklins left. Jay and Barb took 20 people with them to Queens. And you think, man, that was tough. Okay, good. We got Mike and Brittany. Let's start building right here. This is awesome. Announcement comes a few weeks ago. Hey, guys, we're moving to Los Angeles. Like, oh, my gosh, we just got settled. And, oh, yeah, and we're taking a few people with us, too. The Chapettas, the Fofanas, KC, VL and Ashley, Brenda. You're thinking, oh my goodness. Just when I thought we had just made it through the transition. Boom, one more transition right here. So understanding that could be a suffering for us, right? I think that does bring suffering in our lives. As disciples, we're bonded with other disciples here in the church. And we think, man, I'm, I'm with these people. I love them. We've been in the battle and now they're leaving. 
And what can happen is we can start to get a little worn out. Because instead of going to the Spirit of God to give us the strength to overcome the suffering that produces perseverance, which goes into endurance, which goes into character, which goes into hope, we just start getting down and we start getting a little more sinful. Maybe we stop having this kind of faith we had before. And we are in a very hard place as a church because there's going to be a good group of people leaving again. And there's a whole group of people coming in that you don't know. And to think, okay, do I just wait until they come before anything happens? Surely not, right? Does the kingdom go on pause until the new leaders get here? No, there's still people begging for salvation right now. And I believe that God is really training this church to no longer focus on people, but now to focus on him. And for me, I'll be gone in three months. I'll be out of here. No more lessons for me. Amen. Some of you are smiling really big right now. At least I'm reading the Bible. Amen. And good scriptures, right? So, so with this understanding too, that we need to really have conviction, not in man, but in God. And if this church starts kind of like, you know, you start losing the zeal because of transition, then you think, then what's your zeal based on? Because it's happened before where we're here because of people. And we can't allow that now. And I think God is really trying to say, hey, stop focusing on man. Focus on me. Stop getting your strength from people. Get your strength from me. And he's saying, rely on my spirit. I gave you the spirit to make it through this. Start using it. And sometimes it takes you getting pushed to the point where you can't make it anymore to finally say, okay, I get the point, God. I need to start using the spirit right here. Amen? So, sufferings. We rejoice in our sufferings. So as the transition happens, where should our joy be? In God. And how much should it be? We actually should have more joy now than we've ever had before. Right? Because think about it. This is a pretty big transition for the church again. And it hurts. And it's our suffering. And the Bible says, not only so, we rejoice in our sufferings. So this is what faith is all about. This is where faith is just blind craziness. Because you're going through sufferings and you're just so fired up and happy. And people are like, are you crazy? Why are you so fired up when there's so many hard things happening? And you say, it's because I have faith. I have faith that my suffering produces perseverance, which produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. So when I come against suffering, amen, I know it's leading to an awesome place for the church right now. Amen, guys? And so we're all fired up. So I want to encourage you, when you sing, sing with plenty of joy right now. Amen? When people don't sing, you think, "Uh uh-oh, there's something wrong. You know what I mean? Even at midweek, I was looking around, and we were singing a song for Benevolence, and I see somebody just sitting there staring at the person singing. Just like that. I mean, everybody's like, uh, I forget what song we were singing, Humble Yourself or something. It's, Humble yourself in the side of the... You know, we're singing it, and they're just... And you're like, what's going on in their heart right now? Like, what happened? Like, they don't know I'm watching them, but I am really concerned about them. Like, literally, like, we're singing to God about some awesome spiritual things, and they're just staring at him. Some of you guys are like that today. Like, the singers are up here, and you're just staring at them, like, like, what's going on up there? I mean, they're fired up about something. What are they fired up about? You know, instead of saying, no, we all should be fired up together and be singing together. Amen, guys? So, you may not know how to sing, but that's okay. Neither do the people around you. Amen? Amen. All right. Well, we'll just keep going here. So a lot of times people are wondering, okay, 
how do I grow? Ever wonder that? What do I need to grow in? Do you know what you're working on right now? Do you know what sin in your, in your life you need to repent of? I hope so. If not, let me give you a little pointer. All you do is you look at Jesus. Take a step back, look at Jesus. Then you look at yourself. And then you think, what's the difference? And that's what you change. Amen? And that's all you got to do. It's not that hard. Amen? You do need to know Jesus, though. So if you've never read the book of John, time to get your Bible out and start reading that thing. Amen? You'd be surprised how many religious people have never read the book of John. They, like, know everything about religion. And they're like, well, have you ever read John? They're like, no. Like, so you don't even know Jesus. Like, you don't even know who he is. So how are you ever going to become like him, you know? So anyway, that's just a side note care thing. Amen, guys? So... We got some stuff to work on, though, as a church. Amen? Yeah. One thing that I just have to bring up that I've seen happen literally repeatedly, and it pretty much became our theme after staff meeting last week, was godly sorrow. Yeah. Does anybody know the seven qualities of godly sorrow? You don't have to ask, say them right now, but do you know what they are? You know what? I have $5 in my wallet. If you know the seven things of godly sorrow, I'll give you $5 right now. You got to put your hand up literally right now. Okay, Maya had her hand up. Let's see what Maya says. Seven points of godly sorrow. I'll give it to you later. It'd be a little weird if I did it while I'm preaching. The eagerness to clear yourself. The alarm. Yeah. 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 I'll give you five more seconds. I'll split with her. Okay. We'll just leave it at that. Give it up for Maya. She got five of them. There's two more. And honestly, I think sometimes these two can be ones we forget. Yeah. Honestly, these two, I think one of them we lack as a church here in Chicago. On, Let's go to 2 Corinthians 7. We'll take a little detour here. Come on. It says in verse 10, Godly sorrow brings repentance. That leads to salvation and leaves no regret. So, do you love having regret in your life? Isn't that awesome? No, absolutely not. Do you like being led to salvation or to eternal punishment and torture? I'd, I'd bet salvation, right? We're all unified on that one? Okay, good. We're on two, three. Um, repentance. Do you like repenting from your sin and changing it? I hope most of us do. I hope all of us do, really. But I know some of you guys are still working on repentance right here. But for a disciple, you want all three of these. Now, that's easy because it says godly sorrow leads to all three. Let's get some godly sorrow. Oh, amen. This is awesome. Okay, cool. Well, let's keep going. It says, but worldly sorrow brings death. Are we all fired up about death, torture, destruction, agony? No, no. So we don't want worldly sorrow. You guys with me on this? I'm just taking you through a basic, simple thought process that sometimes we forget because it's so simple. You know what I mean? We kind of miss like the forest or the trees right here. Like we don't want death. Therefore, we don't want worldly sorrow. Okay. So now he's going to really help us out and say, well, here's what godly sorrow looks like. Ready, guys? Verse 11. See what this godly sorrow has produced in you. What earnestness. Amen. What eagerness to clear yourself. What indignation. What's that? I mean, would you remember that indignation is a part of it? What is indignation? It's being ticked off at the sin. Yeah. Like, remember when we talked about Phineas, if you were here? Yeah. How he just shish a couple people who were just committing sin in front of the whole entire assembly of the Israelites in Exodus? And God says, that's the kind of zeal I'm talking about. Yeah. Come on. 
indignation is the kind of zeal I'm talking about. You know, there is this very interesting New Age philosophy that works its way into the church. And I'm going to talk about it at leaders meeting, but we need to talk about it a little bit as a church here. I remember when Mike Williamson went out to plant the London church for our movement. And in London, spanking your child is actually a crime. You're not allowed to do it. And so Mike Williamson disciplined his son, Mike Jr., and he went to school and said, oh yeah, my dad gave me a spanking, and it was a very big deal. Because the law of the land is, you don't do that. It's a new age kind of idea that bringing pain and discipline to a child's life actually inhibits them from really being themselves. And if you want a person to be able to develop into who they were created to be, then you don't discipline them, you lead them to the choices they need to make. And so there is a lot of even, you know, progressive, quote unquote, new age parenting that even exists today where new psychologists will say, do not discipline your kids. It actually hurts them in the long run. Let them make their own choices. Now, of course, we don't agree with that. We agree with the Bible, which literally, I mean, in, in so much words says spare the rod, spoil the child. Uh, so so we understand that. I mean, have you ever been at a grocery store? And, and a kid just starts like yelling at his mom or dad and kicking them and maybe flops on the ground and starts freaking out and screaming. And what do you think about that situation? What, what's the next step that needs to happen? It's time to give that kid a little whooping right here. Like this, he needs to earn some respect. And we get it. And there's a little bit of, you're a little indignant, yeah. right? Yeah. You're like, come on, let's go. <laughs> let's, it's going to help him so much. Some of you would rather do it yourself, but you realize you'd get thrown in jail. <laughs> but you realize how important it is. But then comes the kingdom, where we believe in this progressive spiritual parenting, where we think, nope, don't discipline somebody. Because then they're not going to make their own decisions. So if anybody's in sin, we just kind of hands-off approach, let them figure it out on their own. What happens? The, kid, the, the, the people just keep going down the wrong road until they just end up going to jail for the rest of their lives. And so in the kingdom, we have to realize there is no such thing as a new age style of discipling where I have a hands-off approach and let that person just learn from their own mistakes and sooner or later they're just going to blossom into these naturally awesome cranking Christians. That's not how it works in the kingdom. You got to pull out the Bible. You got to use the power of God which brings salvation like it says in Romans 2 right here. Romans 1, 2. 1 as well. And, uh, and dis disciple them on what it looks like to really follow God. Sometimes they get a little ticked off. And then you got to disciple that. But this is what it means to make a church awesome for the Lord. And if you don't have indignation, then you got to be careful. Do you just believe in this new age spiritual parenting kind of style? Or do you say, man, let's do something. Let's get this church where it needs to be. Amen, guys? And so what does that mean? First of all, you need to be spiritual. And second, you call other people to be in spiritual. Yeah. Amen? Yeah. And if you're just letting somebody run around and be as unspiritual as they want in the kingdom, then you're basically just allowing somebody to basically be the spoiled brat of the kingdom that's going to end up, you know, punishing themselves one day because they're going to run into the roadblock of God right there. Yeah. Amen, guys? So we got to help people to make it. So anyway, quick stop at indignation. But we need indignation as a church. I would be fired up if a lot more of you were indignant. And you're just like, this is enough. I've had it. We got to do something right here. I'd be like, amen, finally. This is awesome. But we got to get that kind of heart as disciples. Amen? You guys with me? Okay, cool. All right, let's look at the next one. Indignation, alarm, longing, concern, readiness to see justice done. At every point, you've proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So there it is. 
So basically, you have these seven qualities. Do you understand what these qualities are? Have you studied them out? Do you know what earnestness is? Do you know what um, eagerness to clear yourself is? Do you understand what godly sorrow looks like? Why do you need to? Because godly sorrow leads to repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. But worldly sorrow brings death. Yeah. When somebody has godly sorrow, they are ready to do whatever it takes to change. Yeah. They're ticked off. They're disgusted at their sin. They're, they're going to sacrifice. They're pulling people in to help them. And they can't wait to, to, to see the hope that they change and become righteous people. That, those are a few of the things. But what happens if you have five of the seven? Well, he says, at every point, you've proved yourselves to be innocent in this matter. So the scriptures say, you've got to have all seven. You have to have earnestness about your sin. You have to have eagerness to clear yourself about your sin. For me, that eagerness to clear yourself is a lot of things. But for me, one of those things means God's going to test me again. That I'm not out of the water. He's going to submit me and subject me to the same thing that caused me to sin before. And this time I have to prove myself that I can overcome because I rely on him. Amen? So don't think that you sinned once and, that's, and hope it's never going to happen again. Absolutely it's going to happen again. Absolutely the same temptation is going to come in your life. And God is doing that so that you can clear yourself from that sin that you fell into before. Amen? When you have indignation, we talked about that. You're ticked off at the sin. You know, when you're ticked off at a sin, you don't do it, right? We talked about this before. Do, you, do we have people here who struggle with just killing cats? When was the last time you just wrung a cat's neck and dismembered it? Did you ever do that before? Why not? Because that's nasty. How about, do you struggle with like eating cockroaches and stuff like that? Do you struggle with that? Is that like a big thing? Like, man, bro, I blew it. I ate a cockroach. <laughs> no, no. Why not? Well, because it's disgusting. But a lot of times we think, oh my gosh, I fell into sin. How could this happen? How, how did it just, it's just, I just, just woke up and there I was in sin. I don't know how it happened. It's just, that's not me. That's not me. I mean. I mean, that'd be like somebody's like ripping a cat apart saying, I don't know why I'm doing this. What? Oh my gosh, it's the leg of a cat. What, <laughs> what happened? I, I don't know how this happened. You know? Yeah. It's, it's simple why it happened. Because you like doing it. Yeah. That's right. yeah. You don't just stumble upon a cat and kill it unless you want to. Right. You don't just click on internet pornography unless you really wanted to. You don't just get angry unless you think it's okay. You don't get selfish or, or lie unless you, you like that. If you hated it, you wouldn't do it. So the issue is, when you repeat a sin, you don't really have indignation. You don't really hate it. Let's just be real. As much as you want to pretend like I'm very holy here at church on Sunday, if you keep sinning, that means you like sin. It's as simple as that. I'm not trying to put you down. I've been there myself. But we got to understand what the problem is. We're not indignant. We don't, we're not disgusted by it. And even the world says, no, it's okay. That's how you were born. They want to take away that indignation. They want to say, no, no, this is, this is really just you. And you just have to accept who you are. You have to accept your sinful nature. No, you got to get ticked off at your sinful nature. Whatever it may be. And... Once you get ticked off, that's when you stop change, start to change. You know what I mean? Like when you're disgusted at something, you're just like, ugh, I don't even want to go close to it. Amen, guys? So, it's simple. You sinned because you wanted to. That's why you did it. So if you start hating it, you won't do it. Amen? That's why you don't struggle with eating cockroaches. That's why you don't struggle with dismembering cats. Because it's disgusting. Amen? It's time to get that kind of conviction about your sin right here. And once you get that conviction, it'll stop. Amen, guys? And you'll go to God for help. That's a part of godly sorrow. But in our niceness and political correctness, we try to say, no, no, it's, it's okay. It happens all the time. Uh, it's, you know, you try to take away that indignation thinking you're helping them when really you're not. 
people need to get ticked at that sin. Amen, guys? Amen. Let's keep going. Um, next one. I know this is taking a while, but I really think as a church, we need to get this down. Alarm. If an alarm goes off, what do you do? You run for all your, all your life, right? You see flames coming out, fires everywhere, and the alarms go off. You don't say, yeah, but there's supposed to be food afterwards. <laughs> and then, bro, what do you think I should do? I mean, there's fire outside and the alarms are going off, but there's a meal over there and I see some, some soda cans and man, I like crush. <laughs> no, that's not what you do. You say, forget it. Even if I have to starve today, I'm out of here. You know what I mean? But a lot of times we think, you know, I'm in sin, but you know, should I really cancel my Facebook account? Should I really change my number? I don't know. I mean, I, I, should, I, should I tell them I only date disciples? I don't know. I mean, maybe that's unloving. You know, I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I mean, I want to really protect everybody's feelings that are in sin in the world so that they think we're all good. No, you're a disciple. You're going to hurt people's feelings. They're going to feel condemned by your life because you love God first. Amen? So you just got to understand, that goes with the territory. I'm alarmed and I'm going to repent and I don't care what the consequences are here. Amen, guys? It'd be better to make it to heaven with one eye than to say, well, at least I got two eyes in hell right here. Amen, guys? Yeah. That's what Jesus says in Matthew. Amen. What longing? What is longing? Longing is one day it won't be you anymore. One day you're going to be the expert on how to repent from it. One day people say, go talk to him if you need help with that. Because he's so awesome at this. At this righteousness. Do you believe that? Do you long for that day when that's you? He Talk to this guy about being disciplined. Talk to this guy about going to bed early. Amen? Talk to him. He's so good at it. Do you long for that day when you have that reputation? Talk to this guy who stays focused during fellowship and doesn't talk to everybody around him the whole time. Some of you guys need to repent in that. Because you're joking around the whole time and you can't even get the word of God in your hearts. Maybe that's why you're in sin. Amen? Longing. Next one. Concern. What is concern? Concern is you want to make something happen right here. I mean, when you're concerned about the poor, what do you do? You sit at your home and watch TV? No, you say, guys, let's get together. There's poor people starving out there. We're making sandwiches and we're going to go out and help them. Right? Do you have that kind of idea with your sin? You say, here's my sin. I'm concerned about this sin. Okay, guys, come in. Here's my sin. We need a plan right here. We need to repent. Amen? That's what concern is. Along with other things as well. Next one, you got concern. And then the last one, readiness to see justice done. What is that? You are willing to go to jail for your sin. That would be ready to see justice done, right? And we got a brother who's in jail right now who was ready to see justice done for his sin. He's forgiven before God, but now he's in jail because they said, nope, you still got to pay as far as what the legal rules were of the lands. What about you though? Are you ready to see justice done for your sin? How do you know? You say, well, I don't, I don't really know. I mean, what's justice? Well, first of all, it's openness, right? Because openness hurts. Openness is embarrassing. But if you're not open about your sin, you're not ready to see justice done. So if anybody's hiding sin, they're in, godly, they're in worldly sorrow right there. They're not in godly sorrow. Does that make sense? And so if your Bible talk is like a little weird and people just don't seem fired up and, and they come late all the time and they never bring a visitor and, and they don't really respect your leadership and every now and then they come and sometimes they don't. You got to think, man, these people don't really show a lot of godly sorrow. Maybe there's some hidden sin in their life. Maybe. I'm not saying it's a guarantee, but it's a very likely possibility. Amen? I'm talking to the Bible talk leaders right now. We're kind of like putting different lessons together. Amen, guys? But we need to know this as a church because these Bible talks honestly, guys, need to start growing. You need to start having visitors at your Bible talk. It's, it's not okay just to sit in the chair and enjoy the snacks and love the lesson and you haven't helped anybody to hear the word of God. You should feel a little indignation about that. You should feel a little alarm about that and concern and eagerness to clear yourself and say, man, I'm going to crank this Bible talk right here. For our Bible talk with, with Chris Wooden, we have a goal. We're going to fill up his lobby with visitors. Amen? And he, he printed out a sheet that shows us all the chairs we have to fill. 
And that was our prayer at the beginning of the year. We're going to fill this room. And so that's our goal for the Shining Stars Bible Talk. We're going to have like 45 people out to Bible Talk. Now, God's blessed us with a lot of people. And amen, we got to split this thing up pretty soon. But we still, no matter what, God said, hey, I'm going to make this vision happen. And I believe God is setting this Bible talk up to have one for one visitors and fill the lobby of Chris Wooden's place. Amen. Amen. So Shining Stars Bible Talk, all 18 of you guys out there, we need to all have our visitors out this Thursday. Amen? And we got to say, man, every one of us is responsible for bringing somebody. And guess what happens? When we do that, God fulfills Chris's dream too. Isn't that awesome? And so there's all these prayers being answered as we just say, man, I am going to be a disciple myself. All right. So that's godly sorrow. Do you have it? Do you even know these seven qualities? Do you even pray about them and say, is this my heart? If you don't, then what does it mean? Worldly sorrow brings death. He says at every point you proved yourself innocent. Can you, can you say the same thing about you? At every point I prove myself innocent to my sin because of my godly sorrow. I have every single one of these. Earnestness, eagerness to clear myself, indignation, alarm, longing, concern. I'm ready to see justice done. Is that you? Amen? I want to challenge you to pray about this every day this week. And to pray about your sin and say, do I have alarm? Do I have earnestness? Do I have this towards the sin that I've deliberately committed possibly as a disciple? Do I have this kind of heart towards it? Because if not, then you might be eventually taken out of the kingdom as well. And so that's why you gotta gotta pursue your salvation with fear and trembling right here. And this is what it means, Amen? amen? Awesome, okay, amen, that was a little detour. Why don't we go back to Romans five here? All right, so we're picking it up in uh, verse 6 right here. It says, you see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man. Though for a good man, someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we've now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to him through the death of his son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through his life? Not only is it so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So here, Paul is reminding us of what our lives were like before we became Christians, right? Verse 6, he says, we were powerless. Do you remember how you were before you were a Christian? You just tried to change something and you just couldn't change it, no matter how hard you wanted to. Maybe even said, you know what, I got to go get some self-help books over at Barnes and Nobles. Even that didn't help. And then in verse 8, he says, you were powerless, but then in verse 8, you were a sinner. Well, we already knew that one, right? Amen. And then in verse 10, he says, you... We're God's enemy. What? You were the enemy of God right there. So before you became a Christian, you got to see there's three things that describe you. Powerless, ungodly sinner, enemy of God. Is that intense? And so that makes it all the more powerful that Jesus died for you and given especially where we're at. He says, listen, you know, sometimes... Somebody might die for a good man. Usually a righteous man, though, that guy is a little too beyond people saying, I'll die for him, right? He's righteous. Let him fend for himself right here, you know? Good man, hey, he's a good man. I'm willing to die for that guy. But it says, but but Christ died for the ungodly. So what does this mean? A lot of times we watch a movie, and, and when we watch it, we say, you know, man, I really relate to that character. You know what I mean? So maybe you watch Spider-Man, 
And you're like, Tobey Maguire, you know, he's kind of like, kind of like the weird kid. I mean, I know I relate to this guy, right? Maybe KC didn't or Theo Jr., you know. But uh, maybe they did. I mean, you know, you guys have your moments too. But, <laughs> but I'm like, yeah, there's Tobey Maguire and, you know, he's, he's kind of the weird guy. And, and man, I relate to that. And, and then all of a sudden, like, something happens and he becomes kind of like Spider-Man, you know. And then you think, you know, I'm this special guy and Jesus died for me because I'm so special. Right? But that's not what it's saying, guys. Because if you watch Spider-Man, who was the enemy of Spider-Man in that first one? You guys remember the Green Goblin who kind of went around on his flying saucer and, you know, he just kind of had that weird, crazy face. And, and he like threw, threw like bombs at people and things like that. That's what an, an enemy looks like. You with me right here? You guys with me? And so Jesus didn't die for the Spider-Man version of you. Jesus died for you as the Green Goblin. You were the ungodly sinner that was powerless, that was the enemy of God. And he says, man, it'd be like Spider-Man saying, man, I really want to die for you, Green Goblin. I just want to help you. I want to sacrifice my life for you. That's what it's saying Jesus did. Isn't that incredible? And then it goes on, which we'll look at next week. It goes on to talk about how because of this, we have so much confidence in God. Because if he reconciled us while we are sinners, then how much more shall we have confidence as we're saved in him? Amen? And so it says, so verse 11, so not only is this so, but we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So this is where our joy comes as disciples. That although we understand that we are ungodly, powerless sinners that were enemies of God, Jesus died for us. Yeah. And because of that love that had nothing to do with us being the green goblin, we can't say, man, I was such a cranking green goblin, though. You know what I mean? Like, of course, Jesus would die for me as the green goblin. You say, no, you were nowhere near deserving being saved. But Jesus did it because he's so awesome. And so therefore, because he's so awesome, we got to say, so how much more now as disciples can we take confidence in our Lord? Amen, guys? So... This will help us because then it allows us to see what it really is like to really love the Lord. So, in closing, amen. amen. Meaning song leaders start coming up. Wow. Right back here. Um, in closing, are you more focused on yourself or Jesus? Come on, bro. How do you know? Well, when we're focused on Jesus, we want godly sorrow, we're fired up, and we're, we're rejoicing. But when we get self-focused, we get down, we get sad, and, and we get insecure. You know what I mean? And so here, God is trying to free us to have confidence in him. But what does that happen? It happens when we understand we were the green goblins and Jesus died for us. Amen? Yeah. What do we need now? Godly sorrow. Amen? That's right. To say, man, I will have godly sorrow to repent for my sin. And then and only then will we start to see the power of the Spirit work through us and change other people. Amen, guys. To God be the glory. Thank you. Thank you.